Um, okay, let's start with the time check. It's 2 p.m. in Singapore on Friday, 26 March, 2021. On behalf of the Sing Health Duke and US Global Health Institute, I'm delighted to welcome all of you. I'm Amina Mahmood, Deputy Director of the Institute, and our talk today is part of our monthly global health seminar series. In these sessions, we draw on our faculty as well as guest speakers to present topics of global importance and really engage with our community in Singapore and beyond Singapore. Today's talk takes us a little bit further away from our usually very tight focus on health issues to a broader consideration of how we've all been impacted by this global pandemic and what that impact looks like in concrete numbers. So our presenter today is Dr. Temur Break, who is the Managing Director and Chief Economist at DBS Bank. Before joining DBS, Dr. Baig was principal economist in the Economic Policy Group for the Monetary Authority of Singapore. And he also spent nine years at Deutsche Bank Singapore office. Prior to Singapore, he was based in Washington, DC, where he was senior economist at the International Monetary Fund. And today, he's going to bring all these years of work experience across these different uh, financial institutions to help decipher what the economic impact of COVID has been and what we may expect in the year and maybe years to come. So it's a great pleasure to have us with you today, we have him with us today, and I look forward to learning a lot from his presentation. So thank you, Temu, for being with us. Before I hand over a few housekeeping notes to the audience, please keep yourself on mute during the presentation. The webinar is being recorded, and you can post your questions via the chat box at any time during the presentation, and we will be addressing them at the end of it. So over to you, Temu. Thank you very much, Amina. It's a real pleasure to be part of the Duke and US family and the participants from, I'm assuming, not just Singapore, from elsewhere as well today. Um, I really enjoyed preparing this presentation and I, I hope that I can get some of that enthusiasm rubbed off on you through the course of the next 30 minutes or so while I go over my slides and hopefully my enthusiasm and the content in the slide elicits some question. In fact, just before we came online, I was shown one of the first questions that came in early. It's such a great question. I feel like I should just stop my presentation and start with that, but I won't do that. Um, so I, like I said, I will sort of go over certain data points that we as economists look at. Uh, of course, over the last year or so, we have spent a lot of time uh, looking at the data that you in your profession look at a lot. So whether it is you know, the R naught that uh, we were talking about at the beginning of the pandemic to the issues related to how much uh, infection rates were and then subsequently, you know, the uh, fatality rate and, and now of course uh, the, the vaccination and so on. And I made it a point to include none of those uh, uh, data visualizations because I'm sure there are most of you out there have access to that information and probably even much better than anything that we have. So when I say the pandemic through the lens of data, I am looking at economic data, data on what we call mobility, data on the policy restrictions that came in place, data on policy support packages. And some of the charts I will freeze in a time horizon and then will flash forward it as I sort of continue my narrative. So what my goal is now is to start with where we were right before the crisis, then how we sort of you know, dealt with the disruption uh, and then the legacy of this crisis and how 2021 is panning out. Uh, so those are the sort of you know, broad pointers that I have. So from the beginning, how are we doing in early 2020, then the disruption, the policy intervention, the deep losses that we are taking into account right now, how 2021 is looking at, looking like, and then the legacy. So let's get going. Um, let me remind you that a year and a half ago, life wasn't all that great as far as the global economy was concerned. Uh, my job as a chief economist at DBS is to assure my clients, both internal and external, that the outlook is decent. I was not doing a very uh, good job of, you know, keeping booing people's uh, expectations in early 2020. Uh, coming into 2020, the world was seeing a bit of a downturn in manufacturing strength. So in the chip industry, there was excess supply, not enough demand. Electronics industry, same story. Uh, commodity prices were under a lot of pressure because the world is not doing very well. Then 
people don't really consume that much oil and gas. So those prices were pretty subdued. Uh, trade war had been going on for three years. Um, it just didn't feel very good. And we also had the US election related uncertainty, Brexit related things going on, China US rivalry. So by and large, it was a bit of an underwhelming start to 2020. So what I have for you is the um, forecast for global GDP and a few selected countries that I have. And I'll revisit this thing. You know, see, as you can see, these forecasts were made in October 2019. So stepping into 2020, we had a view uh, formed through the course of 2019, of course, that world will grow at about three and a half percent. US will have a fairly lackluster two percent growth here, followed by European Union, which is perennially stuck in the one to two percent range. China was slowing. We're looking at war, looking at that time of sub 6% growth. India seemed pretty hot, although India had its other issues. And then Singapore was going to have a very unremarkable year, just about 1% growth. And if you put all emerging market economies, developing economies together, which tend to grow the, a decent clip, that was about 4.5% growth. One of the reasons why this outlook was fairly lackluster was because um, protectionism was going up around the world. We, particularly in Asia, have grown so well for so long by embracing globalization, opening up markets, doing a lot of trading. Uh, but uh, preceding Trump, but energized by Trump even to a higher degree, we saw trade restrictions going up all over the world. So the chart that you're seeing right now is a set of data that the World Trade Organization publishes on a fairly regular basis. So they look around the key economies in the world and try to see whether they are taking trade restrictive measures. And of course, there's always some easing of trade barriers. So what are the trade facilitating measures? So the red bar here is the restrictive measures, the black bar here is um, facilitating measures. And it's interesting, right, that through the pre-Trump years and into the Trump years, we saw every single year, more or less, uh, restrictive measures being, you know, a little more onerous and a higher quantity uh, than import facilitation measures. And then, of course, in 2018, 19, it seemed to be a completely tarp charge. Of course, if you disaggregated these bars, you'd probably see China and the US dominating that because US alone was imposing tariff on hundreds of billions of dollars. So it goes not just from China, but also from other countries in the world, including the European Union. So not a happy picture, um, but we didn't know what really unhappy picture was uh, at that point. We thought it was gonna be a subdued year, same old, same old, and then came the crisis. Um, so let me explain to you the analytics that I'm presenting to you. So this is collected by Google. Since all of us have phones, Samsung or Apple or whatever, which tends to have uh, Gmail or you know, YouTube or Google Maps. So we are sending out information about where we are and what we're doing to Google on a real-time basis all over the world. So Google, just from that data, can tell whether you are at home at your office, going to a restaurant, uh, going to a park, uh, going to a museum, all of that. So they started publishing data on global mobility uh, fairly early into the pandemic because it was clear at that point that for the longest time, this data was not particularly interesting, probably said something about an e economic cycle. But as soon as the pandemic began, it became very important to see how people were behaving. So Google publishes this data across a series of categories. I've just alluded to them, actually. Uh, they are people's visits to retail and recreation, like restaurants, going to bars or museums, or it could be going to work or staying at home, or it could be you know, in transportation and so on. So I'm not going to go through all of them. Through the course of this presentation, I will revisit this chart. As you can see, this chart right now is showing you a time frame of January through April of 2020. And what you see is, in uh, through the course of February, March, it was a very dramatic shift. At the beginning of March, life was more or less in line with trend. By the end of March, uh, as we step into April, uh, countries like Italy were 80% below trend in terms of people's visits to restaurants and museums was concerned. And you see country like Japan was still sort of holding off. Uh, things were kind of normal. I personally actually recall having plans to visit Japan in March of last year, which didn't work out. But the reason for that was you know, life was in Japan was through the March of 2020, fairly normal. 
In contrast, in the US, again, after some degree of denial that it's a Chinese problem, not in anywhere else, uh, once the data and the scary stories out of Italy started coming out, people's visits to restaurants, et cetera, began to wane uh, by the middle of March and by early April, thing, the panic was beginning to set in. So as you can see, as you sort of go through the month of April, uh, the gray bar here in Japan uh, joins the fray and people's visits to restaurants, et cetera, was down by 40% by the time April ended. Uh, and meanwhile, UK had joined the Italians in fairly, you know, staying basically at home. I mean, the fairly restrictive, fairly. And by the way, this is not policy induced, right? I mean, some cases policy was there, some cases the government was late in acting, some cases like the US where the government was sort of in two minds on one hand restricting travel from the Chinese, on the other hand saying that, you know, it's not a big deal, but people were voting with their feet. They were not going out and they were beginning to get very, very worried. How did this analysis look in the context of Asia? Well, uh, same analysis, but as you can see, I'm, I should just toggle back and forth between the two charts because I think it's instructive. As you can see here, in end February, not much going on even in Italy. It's only as March sets in, things begin to change in the Western part of the world. But here in Asia, by the time February had ended, some countries were already beginning to take measure. So consider, for example, South Korea, which is an orange line. By the end of February, when the Western world was still sitting pretty, they were down about 25% uh, from trend in terms of visits to restaurants and so on. And then you had the likes of, um, uh, by the red line, Taiwan, which was actually on, on seriously uh, mitigation mode from the beginning of January, uh, things had also started to move. As you can see, uh, sort of influenced by what was happening in China and Hong Kong, people had also, also started to act and things were sort of evolving quite dramatically. And then you come into early part of March, things are just beginning to get a bit hairy in the West, whereas in Asia, things are getting very dramatic. In the Philippines, as you can see, by middle of March, they're about 80% below trend. So they had joined the Italian trend, if you will. Same with India, same with a country like Bangladesh um, and Malaysia and so on. Uh, and then uh, there were the Thailands of the world who were getting worried, but they were trying to sort of skirt a fine balance. Tourism is very, very important to a country like Thailand. Uh, and they were like saying, the, yeah, we're worried, uh, but uh, we will take some measures, but we'll make sure that you know, our livelihoods are not destroyed entirely. Blue dotted line here, Indonesia, exactly the same story. They knew what was happening around. They were getting a bit worried, but they're big countries. There's a lot of political and economic imperatives and they were hesitant. This ended up hurting these economies to some extent later on, but that's the story there all the way through April of last year. So now we are in April. Things are beginning to get hairy and therefore forecasters around the world start to revise their forecast down. So remember, I showed you this chart earlier that at the, and that was depicted with a black bar uh, in October, 2019. We thought 2020 was gonna be a rather underwhelming lackluster year. Six months later in April, we could see the writing on the wall uh, and there was a massive downgrade of forecast taking place. So all the way through April of 2020, um, the IMF basically came out and said the world economy will undergo an unprecedented contraction. Uh, so about 3% decline in global GDP was being forecast by then already. The US was expected to shrink by 6%, European Union by close to 8%. Uh, China was supposed to slow sharply, but already the view was that China is taking pretty strong measures and may not be as poorly off as their Western counterparts where measures were still rather uh, conservative. Um, so, but you will see the next one, uh, India, where even in April of last year, the view was India will slow a bit like China, not a whole lot worse. Singapore was expected to see a contraction, emerging markets in general, which is supposed to grow by four or 5% on a typical year, was now at that point being seen to shrink by about 1% or so. Oh, sorry, grow by only about 1% or so, okay. What else was going on? So policymakers began to sort of take action. So what I'm showing you here is what is known as a stringency index. So to those of you who are familiar with this, prepare to be bored for the next 35 seconds because I'm gonna explain what that is. So this is basically an information on public response that um, what kind of policies do you have in place? Are you shutting down schools? Are you shutting down airports? Are you forcing people to stay at home? 
Are you allowing people to go to grocery stores? So you remember those days, right? I mean, in February, March, those were the sort of uh, imperative that were being dictated by governments gradually. In some cases, there was a resistance from the public. In most cases, people were sort of following. So, so unlike the earlier chart where I was showing you what people were doing, what this chart is showing you, what the government was telling people to do. And this is where we bring in China. Mind you, earlier in that Google mobility data, I showed you all sorts of countries, but I couldn't show you China for the obvious reason is Google is not in China. So I can't really show, find out, you know, what the Chinese were doing with respect to their visits to restaurants, but I can't tell you what the government in China was telling people to do. So here you go. By early January, forget about February and March being in denial and so on, through the course of January, China went on to serious restrictive mode. So by the third week of January, you basically have on the scale of zero to 100, China hitting 70 in terms of how restrictive policies were in terms of mobility restriction, in terms of people ability to go out and conduct day-to-day business, in terms of shutting down schools and offices, forcing everybody to work out of home or go to school from home. All that was happening in China all the way through the second, third week of January. So people saw this from the White House to uh, 10 Downing Street, everybody saw this happening. But the view was, if the Chinese are shutting their economy down, maybe they're gonna prevent the virus from spreading around the world. I guess that's a big mistake or big misperception we had because the asymptomatic infection out of China was already raging around the world. Uh, so China shutting things down at that point sort of helped China, didn't really help the world. Uh, and, and you know the reason I'm sort of elaborating this point is even this morning, somebody asked me this question that, you know, how come the Chinese did not see a massive outbreak um, it, when uh, the virus was spreading around China through the months of December and January. Well, the Chinese probably didn't really know what they were doing in December, but the spread was pretty modest at that time. But as soon as they really got sort of in fear of the spread, they shut their economy down in a very big way. Now, the question is, why didn't they shut their uh, airports down so that people from Wuhan and elsewhere could not take the virus and spread to the rest of the world? I think it was too late by then. If the world had followed the Chinese pattern, which is this gray line of shutting things down and going to the mobility score of 70 in January of 2020, I think it would have been a whole different ball game. And we would not be now casting suspicious glances at the Chinese policymakers about did they spread the virus willingly or not? Because as you can see here, even in other parts of the world, when uh, fears of virus spread began, uh, public sector action did not take place till March. The only country that we have in this chart where public sector began to take some restrictive measure was Italy in late February. Uh, of course, by the time April came along, as you can see, uh, whether it is Italy or France or Spain, everywhere, serious mobility restrictions were being imposed uh, at that point. How was Asia looking like? Well, not as bad as the rest of the world. And Asia, as we began to sort of get news out of China, restrictions began. So as you can see, Singapore began to impose restrictive measures also fairly early. Um, same with uh, South Korea, same with um, uh, Taiwan. Uh, of course, you know, not as severe as uh, China. Only country that sort of tracked China through the months of February, March, to some extent, was Hong Kong, for understandable reasons. But here also, you know, the really uh, shutting the entire economy down sort of measures did not happen till late March early April. But look at this interesting though, India's restrictiveness was as severe as China by then and Philippines, of course, you know, uh, joined hands. And by the time you're in early April, isn't it remarkable? China had already started easing restriction measures, whereas countries like India and Philippines were about to go into a tailspin of shutdown, economic cessation of activities, cessation of economic activities, uh, where whereas China was already feeling that they can sort of ease things up. So for China, the battle was mid-January to mid-March, and by then they were beginning to feel a bit confident, whereas with the rest of the world, only through mid-March onward that we started to getting some serious reckoning. So huge, what we call a dynamic inconsistency between China's policy response and the rest of the world's policy response. So you've got restrictions, you've got people not going out, you gotta help them out, right? And hence, we start seeing policymakers act with serious urgency. And I gotta say, history will judge global policy response kindly 
you may or may not know, but in the course, during the course of the 2008, 2009 global financial crisis, there was actually a lot of dithering initially. In fact, the US Congress rejected the uh, Bush administration's uh, last hurrah in terms of you know, coming up with a big support package, uh, they, they shut it down because they didn't think it was necessary. It was a time when China was taking very strong measures uh, to support its economy, but the Americans, the Europeans were not particularly sure how much, how serious things were. In fact, at that time, the European Union or the European Central Bank was busy raising interest rates. So the lesson from that period to this time was well understood. If there is a crisis, take action immediately. So by March, April of that year, um, into 2020, fiscal packages of extraordinary magnitude started being announced to give people paycheck protection, to give businesses uh, some degree of allowance with respect to taxes, um, giving unemployment benefit in very large quantities, uh, and also coming up with some programs that would help create some jobs. So the whole world already started adjusting in a very big way. You can see about 8% of GDP worth of um, uh, support measures came through, I think something like seven or eight trillion dollars. US was looking at about an 11% of GDP. Our own backyard, Singapore, was looking at a 15% GDP worth of fiscal support measure, European Union close to eight. Interestingly enough, a country like India, which you saw just now in the chart, very restrictive measures, did not come up with a very big package. Um, you could argue that they didn't have the wherewithal because they already are highly indebted. You could also argue that the view was it's kind of pointless to support a lot of li livelihoods now uh, because they need to go through some degree of cleansing and creative destruction anyway. Whatever the motivation, the fact here is very clear, which is that even China and India, uh, despite seeing significant amount of concern and mobility restriction, did not match the developed market counterparts in terms of coming up with very large scale support measures. So, Policy action has kicked in, people are getting worried, there is infection raging all over the world, debts are mounting, and economists around the world are continuing to revise down their forecasts. But in some cases, the forecast revisions are not all unidirectional or not telling the same story, that it's worse for everybody compared to what, how things looked in April. So for the world as a whole, by October of 2020, things are just getting grimmer. There's some hope that you know, vaccines are in the pipeline, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about uh, basically taking stock of all the jobs we have lost, all the people who have uh, died, uh, all the you know, major dislocation to industries and sectors that are going on. So by October of last year, the IMF is now looking at a 4% contraction of global GDP. Uh, EU is looking worse than it was looking in April. So now we're looking at more than 8% contraction. Very, very dramatic is India. In April of last year, it seemed like India might just follow China trajectory. Some slowed down, but not too much. But that was zero to 100 scale of restrictiveness, score of 100 for a few months, took India out of the entire reckoning. So India was not, at that point, October last year was expected to contract by more than 10%. Singapore was also looking at a very deep recession. Contrast, US. April of last year, the view was US was in very big trouble. But once you got that very large stimulus measure, starting to go through, it was very effective. And sales, consumption, things started to look not as dire. So contraction was still on the cards, but more like a 4% contraction, not like a 6% contraction. And then the most impressive of all, China. By October of last year, you know, they were you know, normal. Uh, public events, domestic travel, consumption, everything was back on. And of course, the whole world was buying Chinese goods like there was no tomorrow. And hence, we were actually looking at China's growth now being firmly in the positive territory, something in the 2% range. So from October of 2019 to October of 2020, the world came a very long distance. So those black bars, which were our expectation in October of 20, 2019, by 2020, we were looking at some very, very different sort of, you know, uh, outcomes for global economies relative to what we were a year before that. I will come back to this chart one more time a little later. Now, I showed you this, maybe I didn't spend a lot of time on this, but this chart requires extension and re-examination. So I think I told you when I was setting the ground for late 2019, early 2020, that the world was deglobalizing, uh, 
there was a lot of you know Trump trade war related you know rhetoric that was hurting sentiments. Countries were coming up with a lot of trade restriction measures. Well, once the COVID crisis came in, census prevailed. Uh, all of a sudden, emergency measures were taken to take down some of the trade barriers to allow import of PPEs and essential goods. And instead of going and fighting with each other, there was some degree, not entirely, but some degree of meeting of the mind in the global trade landscape. So all of a sudden, we had trade facilitation measures outnumbering trade restrictive measures in a very big way. So you went from $747 billion worth of restrictive measures in 2019 down to 441, whereas facilitating measures went from 545 to 731. So at least temporarily, notwithstanding Trump's rhetoric, and action, deglobalization got reversed last year. Would that continue through 2021 under Biden in a different world? Let's keep our fingers crossed. I'd like to think so. I think it's a good thing for the world. We're not out of the crisis yet. This is not the time to go out, fight again, those, those completely ruinous and pointless trade wars. All right, uh, this is a technical chart. I apologize for showing this. This is not a kind of chart that I normally would share with a general audience, but it is an important chart to see because in some ways, this is the essence of how well we're fighting this pandemic than we did in the recent past. Uh, toward the end of this presentation, I would look at some really you know, far back historical context. But in this particular slide, I want you to sort of understand what we're doing right now versus what we didn't do in the last big financial crisis. So some of you may know that the genesis of the 2008-2009 financial crisis were, was basically you know, irresponsible lending and risk management by banks of the world. And banks, as a result, in the middle of the 2008-2009 crisis were basically going through an existential crisis. They need a lot of support from the regulators. They needed capital support. They needed guarantees from the government. And as a result, as the crisis sort of abated, the governments put a lot of restrictions and punitive measures on them. That, you, know, you cannot go and lend irresponsibly. You have to build up much more buffer in your balance sheet. You have to behave more responsibly and safely. As a result, in the aftermath of the GFC in 2008, whether it's American banks or in the aftermath of the 2011 debt crisis in Europe, banks were contracting. They were what we call sort of shrinking their balance sheet. They were not lending as much as they used to. They were actually getting out of a bunch of risky business. But this, on one hand, was a good thing. Banks were badly behaved. They brought a big crisis to the global economy in 08, 09. They had to reckon with, with that legacy and they had to become more responsible. But the problem was as banks were sort of you know, cleaning up their balance sheet and behaving more safely, they were hurting the global economy because they were not lending enough. So what you're seeing in this chart in the red line and the black line is that in the eight quarters after those two crises, the red being the US GFC and um, uh, 2011 uh, Euro area being the black line, banks were lending less and less, hence the negative line. How different are things now? So what I have is three quarters subsequent to the pandemic uh, data for China, Euro area in the US. And as you can see, it's stark. These cases, all we are asking for banks to go out lend, don't put businesses out of business, don't tell uh, people who are struggling with uh, joblessness and lack of income to furnish their debt, take it easy on them, go expand your balance sheet, support the economy. So this is a day and night contrast between the crisis response in a decade ago versus the crisis response now. And therefore it is, I think, logical for us to be far more optimistic about the outlook this time than we could have been in the Obama years in the aftermath of the global financial crisis. As soon as Obama took office, the Republican Congress got you know, very vocal about the US needs to sort of consolidate its debt, should not do a lot of pump priming, should not go expand. Uh, they need to sort of you know, make sure that you know, budgets are more responsible. So although the US economy was just a year or two out of the crisis, immediately the Obama administration's imperative was to sort of you know, resort to fiscal conservatism, and that held back US economic recovery substantially. That is not a mistake that the Biden administration is going to do. They will do whatever it takes to get the US economic juggernaut to move in a very proactive manner, and they will get US banks to be a part of this uh, 
uh, expansion of the economy by lending more, not by contracting their balance sheet. Uh, Augustin Karstens, who's the head of the Bank for International Settlements, last summer wrote an article in the Financial Times where he said, banks were the problem in the last crisis. They need to be part of the solution in this crisis. And I think this chart tells you very, very vividly that they are a part of the solution in this crisis. All right, back to our favorite chart, which is the uh, mobility data from Google. But now we're leaving the battle days of January, February, March, April, 2020. And we're looking from April to say end of 2020. And very interesting stuff going on here, right? So as you can see through the course of the summer, things are a bit bad in Europe and the US, uh, but uh, the Americans are you know, sort of beginning to get comfortable and they're you know, not abiding by a lot of restriction stipulations. And they're beginning to go back to consuming and heading to restaurants, even if they're wearing masks, so fully uh, maintaining social distance, but things are back on. So they're only about down 20% through the um, summer, late summer, early fall of 2020. Uh, similarly in the UK, Italy, everywhere, by August of 2020, life is normal. People are going to the beaches, summer is great. It's gonna you know, come back and haunt them later. And that also gets picked up in this data. By the time you're in November, December of 2020, infections have resurged. Um, there is still you know, no sort of major sign in uh, place that you know, we're gonna have roll out vaccines in an expedited manner. And of course the sins of the summer are manifesting in the fall, just like it happened in the 1918, 1919, uh, influenza pandemic, uh, summer, things got better, then winter came and things got worse. And as you can see in this chart, also those lines, particularly in the case of Germany, but also in the case of Italy, by November, December, started to worsen again, people stopped going to restaurants. So these countries had a very uh, mixed record, some divergence, but as you can see in the case of Japan, they began to normalize in the course of summer, they had a few minor setbacks, but by the end of December, they, in this cohort at least, you know, were fully normalized. What about our part of the world? It's a noisy chart, lots of numbers, but look, just focus on India. I told you earlier that by October of 2020, we were looking at India contracting by more than 10%. And that was bearing out from the data that was coming in that even through May and June, uh, visits to restaurants and so on were down by 50% or more. And that only began to change in a very gingerly manner in August, September of last year. Uh, but the rest, so for example, Philippines, as you can see, remain very restrictive, much more so than India. But then there were countries which were getting normalized. Um, even, you know, a country like Bangladesh, by the time December ended, they kind of sort of gave up that, you know, maybe infections are not high or maybe they're high. We don't really care. We need to focus on livelihood. Let's just start going to restaurants and going to recreation and so on. Uh, rest of the Asia, somewhat responsible. I mean, consider Singapore, which is a pink line here. It's a bit noisy, but, you know, again, uh, it was a very gradual change, not like the European examples or the American examples where there were setbacks. There, you know, it's been a more of a systematic uh, easing of restrictions and people's restoration of confidence. So I think you could argue that from a pandemic management perspective, Asia has followed a better model. Uh, and, and I'm talking about just the outcome. I'm not necessarily judging the policies. The outcome itself seems to suggest that it's been a smoother transition to normalcy than the West. All right. So we've sort of talked about policy action, we've talked about you know, how mobility and restrictiveness and all those things happen and how we took some emergency measures to support economies with a lot of fiscal stimulus. Uh, what did it you know, amount to? Well, uh, this chart is showing you what happened to growth in 2020. So change in growth, 2020 growth minus 2019 growth. And on the vertical axis, you're seeing what happened to inflation. The reason I have these two axes is because we economists tend to combine these to say that is like the misery index. If you have very low growth and high inflation, you're really miserable. If you have high growth and low inflation, you are ecstatic. Things are just great, right? So of course, you know, virtually nobody had uh, positive growth uh, in, in 2020 uh, relative to 2019. Uh, hence, you know, I, as you can see in the horizontal axis of this chart, I have no positive values. It starts at zero and goes all the way to minus 16. Uh, so who was the best among the really awful outcome of 2020? Taiwan. Taiwan's growth in 2020 was more or less the same as 2019. They did a fantastic job of quarantining, social distancing, mask wearing from the very beginning. They did not believe the Chinese communication in early uh, 2020, that it was not a big deal. They behaved it was a big deal and they succeeded. Uh, they, they normalized their activities and mobility. They uh, 
sort of you know serve the wave of demand for uh, chips and PPEs and did very well and therefore they get an A plus in terms of the scorecard for 2020 is concerned. Then we have a few countries like Vietnam, South Korea, China, not that bad uh, considering that uh, you know they also went through uh, some torrid times in terms of pandemic management. I suppose what is common between China, Vietnam, South Korea, and Taiwan is they make a lot of electronics. They make a lot of other things, non-electronics also, which the whole world wants to consume from phones to fridges, to furniture, to cars. Uh, and as a result, uh, global demand did not uh, disappear and therefore their downside to economic outcome was the best. Then you've got these blue dots in the center of the chart who are sort of the mixed record. They suffered a lot economic outcome wise. So look at the US, Singapore, both cases growth was 6% below uh, the 2019 growth. And they did also see some degree of you know, inflation coming down, but that doesn't really matter for 2020. What matters is what happened to growth. Um, and then you have got, as you sort of start coming to the left of this chart, uh, the really, really bad cases. I mean, look at Malaysia, Philippines, and India. A huge contraction in economic activity relative to the previous year. And in the case of India, also the misery was really compounded by higher inflation outcome. So in this cohort, clearly the worst grade would be for India. They saw prices go up and they saw massive contraction in activity. Philippines is not that great either. So they saw massive contraction, same with Malaysia. But on the other end of the spectrum within Asia also, we had some really, really spectacular success stories. All right. When I talk about growth and other things, sometimes you know it's not very clear you know, how deep a malaise I'm talking about. So when you think about level of GDP, it gives you a better sense. So look at this chart and this will tell you how deep a contraction happened. And it also will underscore to you how much work we have ahead of us. Through the course of just four quarters in 2020, look at Philippines. Philippines' GDP went down to the level that was prevalent in late 2017, early 2018. So three years worth of GDP gains wiped out, just like that. Not that great for India either. If you draw a horizontal line, oh, let me see if I can annotate this. Uh, can I? All right, I'm not gonna do that, forget it. Uh, everybody can see this chart. <laughs> um, you can see that in the case of India, also that gray line, uh, India is by the time 2020 ended, India was basically back to mid-2018 in terms of economic outcome and contrast that with China and Vietnam where, you know, little blip in early 2020. And then by the time 2020 ended, they were sort of almost going back to the trend line that they had in the preceding years. I mean, how impressive is that? But then the really, really uh, challenging picture is for the rest of Asia over here. So look at a country like um, uh, Indonesia, a uh, little bit of a dip, but already that is taking you back to early 2019 levels. Malaysia, back to 2018 levels. But then there are these really, really stark examples. Singapore, we are now back to 2017 after the contraction. Uh, and then there is um, Hong Kong. I mean, Hong Kong, of course, has other things going on, not just the pandemic. Things are just really, really bad there. But look at that. After the contraction that happened in 2020, Hong Kong is back when they were in 2016. So my point is that this was really, really deep loss of output, and it will take several years of growth before we can go back to anywhere close to trend line if we ever go back. Some crisis leads to permanent loss of income and permanent dislocation. This crisis may be one of those for a few countries. Um, the other thing that happened during the course of the crisis, the legacy, all the big spending measures in 2020 was a huge pickup in debt. So Singapore is now looking at 140% of GDP, but Singapore is not a very good example because Singapore is a very rich country, has a lot of assets. This is what we call the liability side of the balance sheet because Singapore is rich. Singapore having that much debt is not a big deal. It has a big sovereign wealth fund. It has a huge amount of savings from the government. So don't worry about Singapore, they'll be fine. Worry about India, which just in the course of one year has seen its debt GDP ratio go from early high, low 70s to over 80% of GDP worry about the US, um, you know, look at that. Just in the course of one year, more than 25% of GDP has been added to debt. And it's not just the US federal government, US states are suffering, US municipal governments are suffering. And as you have read in the papers, the Biden administration is going for broke for 2021, another very big stimulus measure, debt finance. So debt will keep on going up, major macroeconomic legacy of this crisis.
so I showed you earlier that chart that you know for the to the course of yeah, basically you know this chart that in the course of 2020 a lot of countries lost a lot of output it will be hard to get back on track this is an illustration of how hard it will be in 2019 India's GDP per capita was about six thousand seven hundred dollars going by the IMF's latest forecast India will be basically at the same level at the end of 2022. So from 2019 to 2022, India is looking at a flat line as far as income per capita is concerned. This is a huge step down for an economy where people expect their annual income will go up by five, seven, 10%. So instead of over four years, India's GDP being about 30, 40% higher than where they were in 2019, India will do well to just maintain that level over the course of four years. So that tells you how much of a dent to people's aspirations, expectations this crisis has, has caused. Similarly for Philippines, close to like $9,000 in per capita income 2019, close to $9,000 in per capita in 2022. Vietnam, a bit different. They will keep growing through the middle of this crisis. Uh, Indonesia, not so much. Um, so we've talked a lot about 2020. Now let's start looking forward, think in terms of 2021. So in April of 2020, the view was there'll be a big rebound in 2021. And that view has held up. Uh, you fall a lot in 2020, you pick up a lot in 2021. Uh, so we're looking at the world economy growing by about 5%. US is looking really good. Uh, the IMF is forecasting in this chart, as you can see, about 5%. I think it's going to be actually much, much higher. My forecast is about 6, 6.5% for 2020, for, uh, 2021 for, for the US. European Union is also going to see a rebound. China, you see here, again, these are IMF forecasts, right? About 8% growth for 2021. My team's forecast, 10% plus. Uh, they're just going gangbusters. They have a lot of tailwind from the trade side, domestic consumption side. So China is going to look very good. India will also probably grow very strongly this year. We've been steadily also revising upward our forecast for India, Singapore, some degree of solace after the deep contraction of 2020. All right. I want to sort of, I'm sort of nearing the end of my presentation, but I want to come up with a very big caveat that of course for 2021, these sort of growth numbers are gonna be market pleasing. It'll be good for us. We'll try to forget about the horrible 2020 and start building and pieces. But as you all know that, you know, we're not fully out of the woods, although vaccination is improving in a very impressive manner, but the risk is of course you jump the gun. You go too far. Uh, in terms of normalizing your behavior, and then you start embracing some of these variants or uh, stop behaving you know, responsibly and allowing uh, the virus to spread, even though vaccination is uh, rising substantially. So the US, for example, retail recreation as March was ending, uh, this is data all the way through, I think, 23rd of March, um, people are now basically you know, normalized completely. Um, Germany, same story. Uh, Italy, same story. So, oh no, sorry, Italy, there's been a bit of a dip in confidence, you can see in this chart, uh, whereas the others are sort of doing. So I would not worry too much about Italy if they maintain their behavior on a responsible basis, unless of course they have slipped uh, through the course of January, February. And the reason why the line is dipping now is because their sins of January, February are now manifesting in significantly higher infection in March and probably will spill over to April. Uh, look at this. Again, a country like Bangladesh, they have basically you know, completely started ignoring the pandemic. And now not only is Bangladesh back to trend, they're above trend in terms of retail and recreation behavior. Uh, same with Thailand, uh, you know, maybe very little vaccination going on, but we don't care. We got to work. We got to you know, restore our livelihood. Same with South Korea. Then the rest, a uh, bit of a mixed bag, uh, but not that much of a setback the way we have seen elsewhere, except in the case of Taiwan, it's not a setback, but they're being very defensive and therefore people are actually still at the minus 10, minus 15% on a basis. But you could also argue that maybe we're just entering this world of lots of delivery of food and watching stuff on, on screens. So we're not going to museums and we're not going to uh, restaurants, even if we have been vaccinated or we're not worried about getting infected. Maybe there's been some fundamental change in behavior. Okay. Uh, so we took stock of 2020. We have discussed a little bit about how 2021 is looking, but somehow it's interesting that when you really want to think deeply about how 21, 2022 look like, you might have to travel a century back and see how economies behaved in the aftermath of the 1918, 1919 pandemic influenza, uh, influenza pandemic. 
um, UK, biggest economy in the world at that time. How did they do post-pandemic? Not well at all. So they were sort of growing to the first world war, then comes the pandemic, and then the pandemic ends and the Brits remain very, very grim. They say that between fighting the first world war and dealing with the pandemic, they have taken on too much debt. Uh, they're tired of you know, being part of the world economy. It's time to sort of hunker down, pay down your debt and look inward. So they set up protectionist barriers. They um, made sure that you know, fiscal deficit was you know, uh, reined in. They tried to be very responsible, stiff upper lip and consequently, at the end of 1925, GDP per capita was still substantially lower than it was way back in 1918. So that's the lesson from the UK. If you find religion in terms of you know, fiscal responsibility and being dour and looking inward, you're gonna suffer. It's gonna be years, if not decades, before you come back to your pre-crisis levels. What did the US do at that time, which was the big emerging superpower in the early 1900s? Very different, right? By 1925, US per capita GDP was substantially higher than anything that was seen during the pandemic years. In fact, you can barely see the impact of the pandemic in this chart in this red line. Why? Because they pursued very different policies than the Brits did. They embraced free trade. There was a huge manufacturing revolution going on in the US. It was the biggest exporter of cotton and textile in the world. Uh, they did not. Uh, scale back their fiscal support programs. In fact, there was a whole new deal going on at that time. And so you put it all together. Oh, there was some inspiration of new deal, which was going to be a bigger deal uh, in the early 1930s after the depression. But the 1920s in the US is known as the go-go years. Uh, there was a lot of celebrating and partying and conspicuous consumption. So the US policy was the right policy. It actually was so right that it actually fueled a bubble by the time the 1920s ended. But we're talking about the first few years after the pandemic. The outcome in the US was very different from the outcome in the UK. And I think policymakers around the world today are thinking about the US example post pandemic 1919, not the UK example. Nobody wants to spend the next few years undermining their economy in the name of fiscal austerity, expect more money to be spent and more debt to be incurred. Uh, finally, uh, this is my last slide. After that, I'm happy to take on some questions. I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, what are the other legacies other than you know, lots of debt and lots of difficulties? Well, clearly, uh, some disruptions that were taking place anyway have been accelerated in terms of us using remote education, remote health, uh, you know, ordering food delivery. All those things were there before the pandemic, but certainly we have felt that you know, we can do a much more of that and the world is okay with that. Working from home, like me right now, presenting this from home was almost unthinkable a year and a half ago and we're doing that. So a lot of accelerated disruptions, good or bad. Um, the second part is on policy. And there's a question on data uh, that is among the questions. I will address that when it comes, but just let me point out that I think the big takeaway for policymakers, whether it's health officials or uh, people in the Ministry of Finance or central banks around the world is that we need to be a little more serious about tail risk. When you think about a bell curve, tail is supposed to be a low probability event. But as a government, you don't necessarily just think about the four year, five year electoral cycle. As a responsible authority, you need to think about a 10, 20, 30 year horizon, during which time tail risks will appear. So maybe not another pandemic in the next two years, but surely there'll be another pandemic in the next decade or two. So how do you deal with your public health provisions? How do you deal with your fiscal outlays? All those things, whether it is related to pandemic or climate change, there will be many more policy measures to take into account those tail risks. I firmly believe that's gonna be a lasting legacy of this crisis. Fiscal rethink, I don't wanna to spend too much time about it, but just wanna let you know that don't worry too much if you read in the newspaper headlines that your government's debt to GDP issue has gone up a lot. Uh, government themselves are not that worried and there are ways to deal with this in a world like this. It's not the end of the world. Uh, it's just not the UK example anymore. We will follow the US example post first pandemic of 1919. Uh, and finally, building back better. This is related to, again, climate change and also infrastructure. Um, if you are going to have a crisis like this where lots of people will lose jobs and suffer, you got to rebuild the economy. And I think we have a couple of very compelling use cases for rebuilding our economies. Many parts of the world, infrastructure is poor, 
and just about everywhere else, else in the world, we have a lot to do in terms of making our economies green and more resilient. So I do expect from China to the US to the European Union, as well as our part of Asia, there'll be far more attention provided to building economic resiliency and a green sustainable economy. I will stop right there. Um, okay, Temur, thanks. Thanks a lot for a lot of information to digest. And I'm not sure even, you know, um, if people are as familiar with some of the kind of data points you present, but it's great. It's very interesting picture. And I do have some questions, but let's start with that one question we got from our pre-registration, which is, so how does data influence policy drafting and improvements? So, okay, so, so I think there we've gone through a phase in our history where ideology was far more important than, you know, anecdotal evidence or systematic data analysis. So if you're a Republican or a Tory in a Republican in the US or a Tory in the UK, you believe in low taxes no matter what, you believe in less role of government no matter what, and if you're a Democrat or a Labour Party member, you believe in greater role of government and you believe in higher government intervention. I think we are thankfully going past that, just like medicine has become much more evidence-based, economic policy making is also becoming much more evidence-based. We are doing more experiments as opposed to just pushing our ideology and things are becoming far more data dependent. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's not forget that one of the main reasons global policymakers took very serious action in March, April last year was that highly influential study by Imperial College, which combined epidemiological forecast with economic outturns. And the view was again, that by April of last year, the world is looking at a recession unthinkable uh, in the last century or so, worse than what we saw during the global financial crisis. So that was data dependent, that was based on hard analysis as opposed to ideology. And although a Republican government was in place in the US, which tends not to be very enthusiastic about a bigger role of government, they had to embrace that. Same thing happened all over the world. So when a crisis comes in, I think the data and the evidence trump, forgive the pun, uh, they certainly trump the uh, uh, ideological part. As we speak now, uh, you can see around the world, uh, people who are involved in health are working side by side with economists and people in the central bank because if you don't deal with the pandemic, you cannot restore livelihood. If you don't deal with the livelihood, the economy remains in very bad shape. So those things are all you know, not a trade-off. They all have to be taken care of simultaneously. So I do think data is playing a far greater role in policymaking today than it has basically in our lifetime. Um, okay, so maybe while we are waiting for the audience to post some questions, I have a thought kind of rambling around in my head. I'm not sure if I can articulate it that well, but maybe it, it goes off from what you said about, you know, how pu uh, public health people are now working with economy. So what I've been hearing, it's been very much, oh, you need to have these restrictive public health measures in place, but they are against, you know, uh, economic growth and economic factors. So the two have been, the way I've been seeing the, the argument presented is one versus the other. Your data to me looked like the guys, China and Taiwan, who reacted early and restrictively. So, you know, usually it's like, oh, the more restrictions you have, the worse econ economic outputs you're going to have. But they are the ones who actually ended up doing the best. So suddenly I'm saying, hey, so restrictions are not bad for economy. But, or is it a timing of restrictions? Or, you know, how does one kind of understand the relationship between the two? I think, you know, you hit the nail on the head in the very last, last sentence of yours, Amina, which is that, you know, timing. So because the Chinese and the Taiwanese got serious in January, in fact, the Taiwanese were getting serious late December, early January, the Chinese got very serious by the third week of January, where the rest of the world followed in March and maybe in April. So now you can see the timing was critical because a country like India, got very, very restrictive at some point, but not early enough. And therefore they underwent, you know, a 10% contraction in GDP, but also could not prevent the big loss of uh, livelihoods and lives and huge outbreak of infection. It, it just, you know, turned out to be a total mess. Where in the case of China, the immediate uh, immediacy with which they acted led to a deep contraction of the economy in the first quarter. But boy, oh boy, by April, May, they were beginning to see the light at the end of the tunnel when the whole world was still 
you know, quag in a deep quagmire. So I think timing is the absolute imperative. Uh, there are a lot of things you can do uh, down the road, no matter how heroic they are, they're not going to provide a lot of uh, dividend as long as you know you, uh, you, you miss the boat at the very beginning of acting, especially with a pandemic like this. Yeah, so maybe this is something we have to remember as a, for sure we'll be facing more pandemics, you know, so government uh, officials and policymakers need to <laughs> keep these lessons in mind. But okay, we yeah, have a, a question from uh, Hank Kuhn from the audience at a zero interest rate environment. What are the Americans spending on? They are spending on everything. The housing market in the US is the strongest it has been in 15 years. They're spending a lot of money on uh, communication equipment. So the sales of screens and computers and conference equipment, cameras, you know, they're all going through the roof, which is why China is enjoying uh, a lot of prosperity by selling all those goods to the US. I think the US in the last four months, so you know, from October to Feb October 2020 to February 2021 has run something like a $360 billion in trade deficit. Large of amount of that is against China because the American consumers are buying a lot of electronics, a lot of home improvement equipment. Uh, all of those things are basically made in China. Furniture, drills, appliances, electronics, they're all coming from China and the Americans are spending that a lot. By the way, to those of you who don't know, the stimulus check in America actually has a nickname now. It's called a STIMI. And the way people spend their stimmies is, you know, you know, buying GameStop stocks or, you know, buying a new Apple phone and so on. So people are not saving their stimmies a lot. They're spending it. And basically the government actually wants that. They don't want them to save the money because that means they're very scared about the outlook. You should be optimistic about the outlook and you should just spend the stimmy. That's the call of the hour in the U.S. at least. Yep. Go out and have a good time. Um, okay, another question we have. Um, it's a bit long, so I'm going to read it slowly. Further to one of your final points on tail risk, in the scientific community, there's a lot of ongoing discussion and research on pandemic preparedness. What can you comment on the back-end preparation that might be going on to support and sustain economies in anticipation of the next pandemic? This is a really critical question, and again, goes back to the point that Amina was making. Because time is of the essence on a disease that has a high R naught, you got to act immediately. And if you're waiting for China or European Union to send you PPEs and other uh, protective gear, it's a bit too late. So the need for stockpiling significant amount of protective equipment and having labs that can do testing on viral diseases, which can you know, also work side by side with uh, researchers, I think is absolutely critical. Now you may have years, maybe perhaps decades, that go by when this expenditure looks absolutely useless. But you saw in my charts, right? Once you get hit by a crisis like this, you lose two, three, four years of economic output, and it takes you a very, very long time to come back, and some of the output is lost on a permanent basis. So once you think about from that perspective, the imperative to hedge against those tail risks and spend a bit of money for a number of years, I think it's super important. It's also important that these preparedness will not come from the private sector or from households unless there is a very strong nudge from the public sector. The private sector is very good with deal with day-to-day -day economic decisions. The private sector is not good at all in terms of preparing for pan, uh, tail risks. It just is not cost effective for it. The public sector has to step in and, and that's what I think would be one of the big legacies and, and that's the way I would expect uh, preparedness to take place. Great. Okay, maybe time for one more question. So first of all, thanks for this fascinating talk. It's a compliment to you. Will increased debt from government spending in turn lead to a bubble and future economic downturn as seen in 2008, 2009? How will increased debt today affect future generations who will have to take on this debt burden? See, I mean, you said that there were, you know, general audience, people are asking very specific technical questions. Uh, no, it's great. Uh, look, debt is an issue. I mean, it's just, you know, it's not a non-issue. It's always been an issue for emerging markets in particular who do not have the luxury of the European Union or the US in having a currency or assets that the whole world likes to hold. If you are an emerging market economy, debt is a far bigger burden to you. You are subject to a far greater degree of discipline by markets 
uh, than you, if you are sitting in the comforting, uh, comfortable shoes of the Americans, the Europeans. So yes, uh, countries that have taken on a lot of debt now will find it difficult to deal with it if interest rates go up, if liquidity dries down, and we will probably see some crisis like that sooner or later. Already as we speak, countries like Argentina, South Africa, Turkey, Lebanon are all on the precipice of crisis. Uh, 2021 will not be uh, seeing uh, you know, no further crisis. It will be seeing more of these crises. Uh, that's a legacy. But for the wealthy economies, again, like things like Singapore or Korea or Taiwan or the US or EU, it's not just debt. That's a liability side. There's also a lot of asset. These are rich countries with lots of savings. So they probably will be able to handle this debt. My worry is about the poorer countries, the developing part of the world. They will face a lot of turbulence and loss going forward. Yeah, OK. Um, well, we do have a few more questions, um, but we're at 3 o'clock. So I don't know if you want to go on or uh, are you OK to go on? I'm OK if, if people are OK. If we see a huge drop off in participation, then we know it's time to go. OK, OK. So um, the next question is, would be interested to also hear your perspective with regards to the global economic impact of Brexit. I don't know whether that's getting too far from this topic, but now they want you to, uh, to comment on Brexit and particularly on current pressing need to embrace open trade and open economies. So I don't know if you want to stray into Brexit. I'll give a too. short answer. Uh, UK is not consequential to global economy. Uh, so UK can have all sorts of economic turbulence. It doesn't really matter for the rest of the world. But the world is seeing the cost of leaving a deep multilateral engagement. And that's a good lesson for the rest of the world, that once you get into a deep integration of sorts, uh, getting out is problematic, harmful. Uh, and also, once you're on your own uh, as a relatively small power, 100 years ago, they were number one. They're not even number five today. Uh, they will have to sort of embrace Singapore-like tendencies to some extent. I'm not sure whether they're prepared to do that or not. Okay. Our next question is very specific because, uh, and I, if you if you don't have this knowledge, I think it's fine to skip it, but I'll just put it out there. It's uh, how would you comment on Pakistan's economy and its praised financial support program, and are there any lessons from there? So I'm not sure if you even you know are familiar with that or not. No. Yeah, so full disclosure. I used to cover Pakistan for the IMF, and so I have a couple of years of you know, covering Pakistan. And of course, my friend Raza Bakir is now the governor of the Central Bank. We were colleagues of the IMF. Uh, I think that Pakistan had some at least three, four very, very challenging years. Uh, and the challenges are not entirely over, but it has very capable economic managers, both in the Ministry of Finance and the Central Bank. And of course, I'm a little biased because uh, some people that I know well and, and uh, respect a great deal are at the helm. So that's a good thing. Uh, and I also think that, you know, Pakistan has numerous problems on the geopolitics side and domestic security side. But as far as the economy is concerned, uh, I do think that, um, you know, sort of stabilization of the exchange rate, uh, stabilization of economic fundamentals, uh, things are much better today than they were a year, year and a half ago. And Pakistan has been lucky. This pandemic hasn't hurt Pakistan as badly as it has many other sort of, you know, peer economies. So let's keep our fingers crossed. Okay. And then uh, one last question, to spend is one side of the economy, what about job availability? I think it's very clear that some jobs are not coming back. Uh, if you were a, a vendor in a movie theater, that movie theater is probably gonna go out of business. If you were the travel business, it's really, really hard to sort of hold on to that job because you know, people are so used to making online bookings and the last one year you know, work of you know, gap in travel must have hurt a lot. So, so clearly some, so as I said earlier, there's an accelerated disruption going on. Nature of jobs are changing, is changing. And the way we sort of think about work is also changing. And uh, my boss, Piyush Gupta, pointed out to me the other day that, you know, deglobalization and nationalism and inward looking tendency notwithstanding, I think the pandemic has shown that you can actually have a global pool of labor that you can draw from. I'm not talking about outsourcing. I'm not talking about you know, uh, transcription service of doctors you know, being outsourced to India. I'm talking about the best talent in the world in cryptography or cybersecurity. They can sit in Israel or Silicon Valley, but they can work for your company in Singapore. That realization that you can be very productive and you know, gainfully collaborative is gonna change the nature of job in a very fundamental manner. So yes, some jobs will disappear, but for people with transferable skills, their jobs will probably pay more than ever before. Okay. 
Well, I, I use moderator privilege and ask maybe the last question and then we will wrap up. And again, since since you've been ent entertaining other questions that are kind of taking us a little bit off the tangent of the presentation, I'm going to do the same. And so we know we are in a global health crisis. We are in all kinds of economic crises. Why is the stock market soaring? I have no idea. Um, well, I think this would happen if you have lots of liquidity, very low interest rates, but also when you say the stock market is soaring, what you really mean is there are some very big winners of this crisis. Uh, so companies like you know, Google and Apple and Zoom, they are huge beneficiaries of a world that is shut down where we are sort of stuck to their screens and their routers and their communication pipes day in and day out. So we are in a world I mean, uh, where winners take a lot more than they ever did. So there are a whole bunch of losers out there, uh, regular companies. If you see the stock price of a company like Pepsi, not really doing very well, but if you see Google, it's done very well, Amazon, it's done very well. So we are in a world where it's a bit of a winner take all situation. And those companies sort of take the entire market up with them. And if you keep lots of liquidity, people have nowhere else to invest, they will invest in stock market, they will invest in Bitcoin, they will invest in real estate. And that's what we're seeing, high housing prices, high prices of alternative assets, as well as very high equity prices. Okay, great. So if any of you wanted to go out and play the stocks there, Temur has given you some tips. And with that, I'll say just a huge thank you for being with us for this hour. Uh, I think thank it you was for an me. absolutely fascinating talk, lots to learn, and uh, you know, nice to meet uh, people from across the street from us. So thank you, Temur. Thank, thank you to the audience. Indeed. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Do join us next month for our next Global Health Seminar series and be safe.